morning and um, welcome everybody. I hope you're well from wherever you're joining us this morning. Um, we're just going to wait a few minutes uh, just for everyone to get into the uh, waiting room before we begin um, and then I'll do the introduction and we'll crack on with the webinar. So we're delighted so many of you have joined us uh, for the first time or first of our LEPADA Leaders Conversations. Um, it's very warm welcome to LEPADA members and the other trade associations and our audience uh, who are joining us today. Um, one little sort of bit of housekeeping, we're going to have the, the questions and answers, but at the end you'll see there's a Q&A button and there's also the chat function. If you want to submit a question, please do, and my colleague Gillian will um, kind of make sure that they're um, held to the end of the session. And if you want to do any comments as we're going through, uh, you use the chat function and that's shared with both speakers and attendees um, as we go on. Um, so really what this was sort of born out of is, you know, we've all been struggling with the enormity of these events and we wanted to reach out to some influential people of the cultural world um, and ask them just to spare an hour of their time uh, to share their experiences and future predictions at this time. Um, you know, we're all kind of trying to grapple with this sense of the new normal. Um, and I have to say, we were utterly overwhelmed by the response uh, and the in, sort of the initiative of Lepada Leaders was born. And I really am thrilled that the person who's kicking it off today is Dr. Tristram Hunt, uh, academic, historian, biographer, author, politician, even a former Cambridge footlight. Is there nothing the director of the VNA hasn't turned his hand to yet or is about to? So, uh, Tristram, welcome to the Lepada Leader Series. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll kind of kick off with one of a sort of generic um, question of what's going on at the moment that we're all kind of talking about. And, you know, how will this crisis revolutionise the arts world and, and alter how we enjoy it, do you think? Well, it's definitely going to have a, a, a major impact for 12, 24 months. And, and then we're in the hands of the, the scientists uh, as to whether... Uh, elements uh, of normality will return. But either way, I think right across the cultural sector, there have been seismic shifts. We can see particular concerns for the viability uh, of uh, our colleagues in the theatre world, uh, for example, colleagues in independent museums like the Mary Rose Trust, desperately dependent uh, upon visitor uh, income. And then ourselves, uh, uh, big national museums who have been dependent in recent years more and more on a business model connected to high volume uh, blockbuster exhibitions which cross subsidize the collections work, the research work, the scholarship uh, of the museum in the absence of what other museums around the world have which are entry charges. Um, yeah. And so how we balance that where will we see kind of over the next year museum numbers at 20 percent 30 percent of their pre-covid uh, uh, rate and what the implication of that for the functioning of museums are now some will will perhaps enjoy a kind of return to a, a much slower museum a more intimate museum a more scholastic uh, museum and we obviously welcome uh, all of those but I think we don't want to jettison the achievements of the last 10 to 15 years where museums have been these great engines, uh, not only of civic regeneration, but of public culture, of soft power, of you know, world-class exhibitions. Uh, but there's no doubt our provision, particularly at the VNA, where we've kind of pioneered many of this, this exhibition uh, model, is going to be more limited uh, and more constrained. Mm. Thank you. And I suppose following on from that, what, what do you see as the responsibility for the nation's museums when they are actually closed for public work? Because although you rely on voluntary contribution, you're also essentially sort of owned by the public. So what, what can they be used to aspire us, inspire us in, in some way I during mean, we, this period? We hold in custodianship the nation's collection. So we're just the caretakers um, and this is the, the, the public's mm. collection and even while our physical doors are closed quite rightly there's a demand to see the collection in new and interesting 
ways and we work relentlessly to ensure that uh, for example you know scholars in, in in the trade bodies and elsewhere can search the collections appropriately that the uh, the right level of, um, of of information is connected to that but also to bring the collection to new eyes in new ways and today we've just launched for example a really wonderful film on youtube of anna jackson our keeper of the asian department taking people around the currently mothballed kimono exhibition you know this was five years work for her yeah. which was only then on show 14 days uh, obviously there's a catalog with it there's a lot that goes with it um, but whether it's our, our YouTube work whether it's let's make it Wednesdays for, for you know for families who are reaching the end of their creative capacity <laughs> themselves to look after their children uh, yes. whether it's uh, our, our Instagram accounts using social media to enliven and, and open up the collections in new ways is a really important part of what we do. I think at the end we'll we'll try and add that link when we send out something afterwards add great. the YouTube link because that'd be wonderful and do you think um, just you know obviously there's loads of debate at the moment about whether children can go back on the 1st of June um, I, I'm not sort of suggesting that a whole load of little people run around the museum in the way that they are in Denmark but could there be a place in education for the museums when the students who won't be able to go back in in the next academic year um, is that something that is worth debating whether students could use the VA as a, a place of inspiration and learning or is that too complicated <laughs> no I mean this is this is one of the intense frustrations I mean I, I I, I think we will not get school groups and we will not be catering to school groups in the same way because schools will not want to put their kids on a train or on a bus or yeah. on a tube to go and visit us. Um, yeah. That doesn't mean we're not open every day for young inquiring minds and their families to, to come and see us. I, I, I've made it a particular focus of, of my directorship to support the teaching of design and technology, going right back to the roots of the VNA uh, in the design school movement over the last few years. And we've got really great digital provision uh, for a program called Innovate to support Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4 um, design and technology in schools right across the country. So actually having taken the digital step with that, we'll be able to provide more of that uh, over the coming year. But what makes learning in a museum special is the object. Uh, yeah. What we can provide, which, you know, a university card or an online course card is that sense of physical connection mm. to the great work of craftsmanship by the human hand. And we have to be realistic about what we can do in the absence of that, that sense of connection. So we want as many inquiring minds as possible, but you know, I know the Met, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, for example, has canceled all tours, all education, all lectures for the rest of yeah. the year. Uh, and, and we'll be wrestling with similar decisions. And do you think actually, I mean, the central London museums obviously have greater challenges than other places, but is it particularly difficult because you're in that kind of museum mile in terms of might you be one of the last to open because of how that might affect public transport or will it will all of the London's national museums open at the same time, do you think? No, they won't. There'll they'll be a process of opening from early July onwards and we're, we're, we're wrestling with the date at the moment. You know, we want to make it a moment, but we also don't want to overload limited um, public transport. It is still absurd that there's no step-free access at South Kensington tube station, for yeah. example, the place where you have more buggies uh, and more people yeah. wanting to uh, get through the gates than sort of anywhere else. Um, yeah. there's, there's no step free um, access so we're thinking about the opening date now but it, it will be after you know uh, uh, after mid July when museums will be allowed to open I think people's appetite to begin with is going to be for outside London activity I think they want to go to country houses and they want to go to yeah. parks and they want to experience all that and we are wholly dependent upon public transport if, if we're yeah. realistic for both our staff and our visitors and if public transport is only running at 15 to 20 percent of capacity then we have a very limited ability to see how mm. many will also come through the door 
And actually, so following on, I mean, you mentioned funding before, but how can you acquire that funding and donations if you can't kind of have the voluntary contributions and some of the donations you're used to? How can you keep the acquisition going? I think it's very hard. I mean, we've, we've, we've frozen our acquisition budget, for example, this yeah. year. And uh, I appeal to generous and civic minded Lepada members uh, who okay. want to support the world's greatest museum of art, design and performance and are not able to shift some beautiful objects at the requisite price to think about a wonderful donation uh, to the v &A. But it's going to be very hard to, to raise the, the kind of funds that, that, that we would want. And what we're seeking to do is to hold on to our members, our director's circle, our corporate partners, our, 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 our supporters. But we will have a marked you know, diminution of funding uh, over the coming year, which will affect all areas of, of the organisation. And we, we look with interest at, you know, the interventions of the French government, the German government, the Italian government, the Austrian government in supporting yeah. their cultural institutions. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say I haven't followed all of it, but I've seen the proactiveness of Germany has been, I mean, made a complete difference uh, to the art uh funding there and they're in a totally different shape i mean obviously publicly but also commercially as well it's kind of made a bit of a difference um just uh, on on the lepada donations and this is probably an area we shouldn't get into but i'm sure you could get some very nice ivory given what's going on there um but anyway as you say um, we won't get into it. <laughs> no i think you probably will get some nice ivory but uh because they're still fighting um um, one of the things I suppose I wonder, sort of looking at how um, museums might adapt to the age of social distancing and how people might expect to navigate the V&A, and I suppose there's two questions in here. One is um, how that flow might work for a general uh, member of the public. And the second is, in terms of donations, might you be looking to do more sort of exclusive visits for sponsors and things where you can look after um, a small section of donors to do something quite exquisite i mean we we will seek to um you know manage exclusive experiences as effectively as possible for donors and supporters as we do at the moment whether that's after hours or before hours whether it's uh, breakfast tours of exhibition whether it's evening uh, receptions but we don't know the appetite yet for yeah. um people wanting that you know uh, there there will be a, ve a very different feel for the kind of kind of convivial London cultural event where you have access to a great exhibition and beautiful surroundings uh, mm. uh, alongside interesting people um, if there is still a great fear about infection um, yeah. uh, and so I think we will have probably more smaller events where people feel confident that they can see something, but also in a, in a safe environment vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, COVID-19. Um, mm. And that might have kind of devastating impacts on my diary, but I think it's important that we, yeah. that we, that we connect to as many as possible, um, those who have kind of stayed with us during the course of this. And it's been wonderful to see supporters and members, uh, you know, actively contacting us saying, we know you're in trouble, how can we help? Mm. Okay. And in terms of how the general public might come in, do you think that sort of timed entry and um, sort of one way traffic or these are the things that we've been looking at within the live events sector for art fairs as well. But um, I, mean, I wonder we're, in, we're... in the huge building, you've obviously got two entrances, you've got sort of lots to play with, but that's also quite a logistic minefield, I would think. We're, we're looking at all of that um, yeah. and, you know, you want to have a beautiful environment at the v &A. What is the v &A about? It's about a beautiful civic environment. And if it feels like you're going to, you know, Barclays Bank or Tesco, well, you know, you're not going to bother. Uh, actually, yeah. you've got to go there and feel uplifted. And so we don't want it overly aggressive, but we also want people to know that we are taking the situation seriously. Um, my view is that if you've made the effort to get to the VNA by public transport or bike or walking, actually, you, you know what you want to do there. And actually, you're, you're going to take seriously the, the, 
kind of framework for social interaction in, in, in an era of, of Corona. So we're taking it very seriously, but we don't want to be too aggressive. The greatness of v a is seven miles of gallery, um, which can, you know, consume uh, people um, in, 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 you know, you know, wandering the ceramics galleries is, is a very, very good way uh, of, um, of kind of experiencing culture uh, in such a period. But we, you know, we're not going to be able to open as we were originally on the same timetable with the same amount of the museum open and all the rest of it. So we'll have to take it step by step. And do you think, because obviously there's seven miles of V&A, then you've got, you know, a nice little Blythe house down the road, but, but uh, actually what about sort of Dundee and the Museum of Childhood? Would you kind of act centrally or will you t take kind of each area slightly differently in terms of how you um, reopen and also treat the social distancing and things? So the Museum of Childhood is, is, is now closed it's clo um, yeah. and, and it's, it's, it's going to remain closed for our really important regeneration project there um, on building creative confidence and cultural capital in East London um, about teaching young people about the importance of art and design and moving it from a, a museum which was really about the social history of childhood to a museum much more focused uh, on inspiring young people through art and design. So in terms of the, 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 the challenge there, that, that's, a, that's a kind of, um, that's, a, that's an ongoing kind of development and regeneration challenge. And yeah. Dundee um, is, it, it's, it's, it doesn't answer um, to me, I'm not the director of VNA Dundee, Phil Long is, we're, we're part of this partnership between the universities and the Scottish government. But I think, um, I mean, there'd probably be a bit of difference between what goes on in Scotland and England, as, as, as we're seeing. Yes. But I think, uh, but I think <laughs> museums, museums around the world are, are are taking similar approaches. I think the difference in the, in in particularly in London is we've had this very successful exhibition-based model, much more so than in Germany um, or or France. I mean, it, it, Italy obviously has you know, a sometimes similar approach. Um, so that's the area of particular constraint and concern. Um, just thinking about, I mean, mentioning the different countries, which, which in terms of how the government has responded, what, what country do you think could we learn lessons from our DCMS should be looking at? Well, I'm hugely impressed with Germany. Um, yeah. I, th I think they've shown leadership both in terms of the support for public institutions, but also the creative industries, for freelancers, for artists, for galleries, for the cultural ecology. They, they, they understand the importance of it. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, what they had was a, a cohesive and confident response to the crisis. Now, we've had an announcement yesterday from the, from the Secretary of State of uh, a kind of cultural renewal task force, uh, I think, with Nick Sorota and Neil Mendoza and other other individuals on, which is which is good. But you know, we need a big response from them because if our revenue is is shot for the for the next year, um, it's going to be very very difficult to maintain uh, the kind of level of ambition um, that that government wants us to do. Um, you know, we are. We are told we're these great vehicles for global Britain, for soft power, for inbound tourism, as well as all of the activity we do for well-being, for education, for loans, for calories. Uh, and it's going to be hard doing that if you've lost 70%, say, of your audience numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the, so, yeah, so one of the things that I was also looking at, I suppose, is, is do you think that I mean it's such a sort of seismic shift that we're going through and so 70% of audience members is one thing which is going to kind of it pushes us in social distancing and maybe putting things more online but do you think some elements of this are going to be permanent or do you think it's a, a, a sort of a, a short period? I, I just don't know I mean I think yeah. I think there will be permanent shifts in in terms of resilience management because this might well come back uh, mm. again, not just in terms of a second spike, but also who, who knows whether there'll be more pandemics in the future. And so our ability to cope with them, which means 
some of our digital resources, some of our digital capacity will have to respond uh, to that. I think we're all, you know, looking at this new way of working, a mix between homework and office work, um, the staggering of, uh, of, of hours coming in, in into work. I think museums, alongside many other um, you know, large employers and large businesses will be affected uh, by this. But if we have a vaccine in a year, 18 months, um, yeah. then it's not going to return to as it was. And actually, we should use this moment to improve and to change and to, and to modernize. Yeah. But hopefully that, that, that willingness to congregate, um, whether it's at literary festivals or op or theatre or museums will return. It has to return, I think, to the, yeah. the human condition. And I think as well that, you know, you can see the working from home and operating via Zoom and everything is one thing, but actually the contact and the, the um, of the objects is something that you just can't ever really get digitally. Uh, can't the because it's the, it's, the seren <laughs> it's the serendipity, it's the, it's the yeah. moving from the print room to the silver gallery to the Gilbert collection to the 20th century collection and on 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 the screen everything is is wonderfully curated as they say yeah. now you know everything is sort of served up for you and actually you, you want some surprise you want some and that's you know the particular wonder of of, of the VNA both its weaknesses in, in a sense the multiplicity of the collection but that's also its its strength and its wonder um, and you know, it is, it, it, you know, it, it retains that cabinet of curiosities, which is, which is what you want, I think. I actually think I totally agree. And although the serendipity is wonderful to kind of move between them, I did love one of the design festivals where suddenly I was pushed to go to areas of the VA that I had never been in, some sort of dusty corridors and then some fabulous things as well. But I think you quite often just gravitate towards the things you know you love. And I thought that was such a wonderful kind of trail that it would be lovely to do some more of those as well and find those hidden corners. I miss them. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I think in, in, encouraging a celebration and, you know, wonder at, um, and maybe we've been sort of guilty of this in our, uh, you know, focus on exhibitions of the value and wonder of the permanent collection. You know, mm. this is in and of itself, it's worth traveling around the world to come and see alongside our great exhibitions and, you know, ACE yeah. Cap and all the other uh, components of the VNA. Um, now, one sort of slightly uh, odd question, I suppose, but is it, the VNA has obviously existed for quite a, some time now. So you've been through a few crises before. Are there things that maybe either from the Spanish flu epidemic or World War II that are kind of um, actually, uh, well, I suppose, how did the VNA cope in the past? And are there some learning mechanisms from that that you're applying now? It's very interesting that we're, 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 we're feverishly trying to go through the archives uh, to see if there's some learnings from the Spanish flu. Uh, yeah. Because the, the wonderful thing about the VNA is both the longevity but also the strength of our, um, our archives. Uh, so, so we're looking at that. that. Nothing has emerged quite yet, but okay. we're, we're <laughs> on to that. Um, and I think with World War II, and, you know, we, we consciously kept the shrapnel blasts on Exhibition Road in, 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 in the stones of yeah. the building to remind um, people both, both of the sacrifice of, of staff of the VNA and, and also the place of the VNA in, in, um, in the war. There, there was, you know, the covering up of collections, the, move, the, the, the moving of collections, but also, and, and my colleague Gabriele Finaldi is very, very good on this because of what happened at Trafalgar Square, you could still have that social connection and that social intimacy yeah. in, a, in a civic space and the the sort of wickedness of of uh, of an of you know either, either influenza or, or or covid is is the absence of of that so it's the mm. it's the it's it's the the human connection alongside the material culture which has been lost which was yeah. not lost um during yeah. uh, uh during war uh, but whether whether the 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 i suppose the other thing is you know going back to the Spanish flu and other, other periods of, of public health crises, just the numbers involved now, the volumes involved now are at a different order. Um, yeah. And quite rightly, the, the, you know, the number of children going through and the sense of ownership and, uh, and engagement with our museums now, it's just of a different order. Yeah. 
And actually, so that moves on quite well to sort of the audience diversification. Do you think you'll have quite a different audience? Obviously, we, we know that you're going to have to change the sort of um, school groups and things like that for this year. But do you think going forward, it will shift who your core audience is? Or do you have such a diversified audience anyway? It's hard to say. I, I think, it, I, again, I don't know what's going to happen. Our kind of, <laughs> you know, young people who we know are at less risk uh, of this virus than old people going to flood central London and come to museums and hang out at, uh, in, in the evening in, in galleries and things, that would be wonderful. We'd, 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 yeah. we'd love that. Or are we going to see actually a, a sense of sort of almost, to go back to your early conversation, blitz spirit amongst some of our more elderly uh, yeah. visitors who say, well, you know, I've seen through this, that and the other, uh, you know, this isn't going to stop me visiting my wonderful V&A. Um, yeah. I, I think we will see a fall off in young families coming in from outside London on a train, on a tube, to a museum. Mm. I think there'll be nervousness about that. I think they'd rather, you know, go to a regional museum or go to a country house or for, for, for you know, heritage or leisure uh, activity. And all our indications at the moment is that we have to, you know, sort of begin where we stand and invite London back into their uh, museums and, and build up the confidence there and then grow outwards. Um, and obviously our international visitors who are, you know, hover around 50% of, of visitors to the v &A, well, that, that looks completely shot um, for the next year. I'm going to be very rude because it's live. There's a, a big drill that started, and so I'm just going to close my window. But before I do that, I'm going to ask you another question and then I'll return. It's very noisy. Um, one of the things I've really enjoyed looking at on the VNA website is the pandemic objects um, that you're kind of collecting. And I wonder, you know, obviously there's lots of contribution from members of the public. It's, it's very interesting the way it's developing. Do you have a kind of a curatorial plan um, for what to do with the pandemic objects going forward? Um, so pandemic objects led by one of our, our great curate, curators, uh, Brendan Cormier, um, is a really interesting way of thinking about the material culture um, in, of, of, of of COVID um, and it's both as it were items which are particular to the, the crisis the rainbow posters and other things mm -hmm. but also everyday objects like sewing machines which go from being uh, you know maybe an enjoyable hobby to actually sometimes got a life and death issues of sewing masks supporting yeah. uh, NHS uh, workers um, and so Again, the strength of the VNA is that, well, let's put this alongside items from the 1660s, or let's put this alongside uh, items from the late medieval period. Uh, let's put these items in context of previous periods of plague, pandemic, loneliness, you know, mortality, isolation, maybe in the future, you know, xenophobia, uh, and, and see where it lands. So we're, we're thinking about, um, we're thinking about which items we want to accession to the collection for the, for the long run mm -hmm. and then also thinking about how we develop a, a, a cohesive story around this material culture uh, so we're kind of on it but we haven't got the philosophy yet and with think i suppose as well the mask you've got the sewing machine but presumably things that uh, in terms of 3d pin printing and making the visors and things like that might also be absolutely um, something absolutely alongside the arms so. and armor <laughs> exactly, 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 exactly. I can exactly. see that working very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the um, exhibitions that I was very sad that uh, hasn't come to pass is the Renaissance watercolours. Um, and I wondered if there's a plan to do something digitally or put it on hold until you're open again or what you might consider um, with that. And sorry if I've put you on the spot with that. <laughs> no, I mean, we were, but, we, we were very sad to see um, the cancellation of Renaissance watercolours, which again was a, a work of many years scholarship by uh, Mark Evans, our senior curator uh, of paintings. Uh, we have a, uh, we have a wonderful publication. Oh, uh, which we can buy, presumably. Which you can buy, which comes from <laughs> it. So we, we, 
you know, the, the scholarship lives on through the, through the book, um, but we will also uh, seek to mount uh, a, a smaller display of, you know, essentially the items from our collection um, in, in our galleries um, later this year. And that will obviously have uh, a, a digital component as well, but it won't be the full, uh, as it were, exhibition in, in digital format. It will necessarily be, be smaller. But it's, um, it's heartbreaking that because I'm, I'm you know, sometimes uh, the v &A is uh, subject to criticism in recent years of um, too much fashion or too much pop or uh, too, too many other parts of our, you know, mm. range of activities. And I'm very proud of our fashion exhibitions and our performance exhibitions. But it was important to have a fine art um, exhibition. Mm. Uh, but it was going to open, I think, on May the 15th. So it was just right in the, in the kind of death trap. Um, oh, okay. So it, it, it will live on as a scholarship and as a display at the museum later this year with a digital component. And in terms of planning exhibitions, um, presumably the logistics of kind of moving curators and objects is all kind of playing into this. And we, we have that also in um, the arts and antiques industry in the sense of whether art fairs can carry on and, and the idea of somebody quarantining the other side to kind of come to England. But is that all on sort of hold for the moment or are you still discussing sort of exhibitions that you have planned? Because presumably you're, you're planning quite a few years ahead so you're kind of in dialogue with international absolutely I mean, everyone at the moment is sending each other letters about right. what's being delayed and what's being cancelled and thank you very yeah. much for your generosity in agreeing to so so we okay. are um you know seeking the extension of loans from some of our international colleagues in turn some international colleagues are either cancelling loans or seeking extension of loans um, and our head of exhibitions, Daniel Slater, is, in, is involved in this very complicated global dance uh, of exhibitions. Now, I think we'll probably see less of that. Uh, I, I think that there, there, there was a sense, certainly on ecological grounds, of the frenzy of whether it was art fairs, whether it was biennales, whether it was uh, exhibitions. I think some of that is, is going to taper um, in, um, in, in the coming years. But I also think um, traveling exhibitions and public exhibitions are great vehicles for mm. cultural understanding and exchange and, and what museums do. And I, and I know, again, our, our colleagues at the National Gallery, for example, have a really big and important show uh, opening um, in, in Japan of, of, of works. We ourselves have important shows opening in Shenzhen um, in our galleries in, 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 in China, which we hope to open mm. Uh, again later this year. So we're going to keep going with it because it's in, important, uh, but I think there will be less of it and we're all involved in this very complicated dance of, um, of exchange and sort yeah. of mothballing and loaning and cancelling. And presumably actually by default, just thinking about uh, the museum world, but also within art and antiques and interiors, there may be a little bit of a trend towards loving the British in a, in a slightly uh, way that maybe some people weren't looking at pre-Brexit, <laughs> but now we may be forced to kind of be looking very much within our own island for sort of materials and objects and craftsmanship, heritage. Absolutely, and, 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 and we should play an important role within that of, um, uh, of providing inspiration for that. That's always been part of our, 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 our role and you know the British galleries tell that story but the importance of the VNA is in a sense to in many ways explore some of the, the global influences behind that so you know William Morris the great British uh, designer what most inspired him about the VNA was the Ardabil carpet and the story of, of Persian design and, and he actually it's he actually ensure that the VNA purchased the Ardabil uh, carpet. So our role is absolutely to, to encourage homegrown design and talent, but also seek to place that within a, within a broader cultural and historical context. Thank you. I've got one last question before we open it to um, our uh, attendees, and that is, is there an area or an artwork in the Victoria Albert Museum that you kind of particularly like to visit now 
uh, during kind of lockdown? What, what, what are you drawn to in your own collection? Well, I, I, when I go, when I sneak in, um, claiming I need to have a meeting, um, <laughs> I, I, go and, I, I go and wander the cast course. I go and wander the faster cast course because you, you know, I'm at home a lot at the moment and I go on my yeah. state sanctioned walk in my local park. But um, the thing about the cast course is the sense of the sublime and, and wonder and, and difference and kind of awesomeness of creation. And you, it's almost like wandering into, a, you know, the Rocky Mountains uh, or you know, uh, North Devon coast or something wonderful. Um, and so I go there and I look at Trajan's column and I look at Pisano's pulpits and I look at Michelangelo's David and uh, I look at a lot of Michelangelo um, and I look at Donatello and all of plaster cast copies. But um, that's the, and it's a very v &A space because it's a story yeah. of global influence. It's a story of making, um, it's a story of production. Um, and it's a story that goes on with, to go back to your point about 3D design and making today. Yeah. And presumably as well, you're, I mean, it's, it's an awesome experience, but you're also going to Rome, Florence, Pisa, exactly. even Spain, you've got the kind of doors, haven't you? So you're kind of going through all of those things. Okay, well, thank you so, so much. I think I can see that some Q&As are coming and there's some chat. So I think if we take some questions um, from the panellists, um, Julian, are you? Yeah, are you, sure. Um, so one question, we've actually had a few versions of this um, come in, um, is around collaboration with other institutions and collections and whether um, that might help take the place um, of acquisitions um, given this time of budget freeze. And, and then off the back of that, we've also had a couple questions about um, how you might collaborate with smaller um, institutions specifically um, to help them recover from this. And I think, sorry, I'm just going to, I think one of those particularly was the Mary Rose because you mentioned the Mary yes. Rose and I know that there's someone who's working with the Mary Roses online at the moment, I can see. <laughs> Great. Um, I think, the, I mean, the most important thing for the Mary Rose at the moment is people to give it money um, yeah. and, uh, and to and ensure its, 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 its revenue um, is um, is sustained. Um, the the v and is, is, is very, very proud to be the largest lender of objects to other institutions in the country. So we work with more institutions in, in lending uh, the collection uh, as a national uh, because of the, you know, the, the range and extent um, of it. And we, we will seek to continue to do that. Obviously, we've got v and Dundee, our, our partner institution in Scotland and our work in Tayside. One of the things I'm very passionate about, and you know, COVID has got in the way of this, but but, but we're getting there, is to ensure that the V&A collection at the world of Wedgwood um, is mobilised much more effectively, and that will be really our, our a, a kind of base within Staffordshire and the Midlands, where we can connect much more effectively uh, to obviously uh, Stoke on Trent, but uh, across to the East Midlands as well, um, and whether it's you know um loaned exhibitions to chester or to exeter um our work uh, we've had a you know long connection to the bose museum uh we, we will seek to 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 help with this the, the the challenge i think for for many regional institutions though is is simply revenue funding to accept um um, collections to accept loans to be able to to, to, to manage those situations so we're, we're absolutely up for the, the partnership um, but I, 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 I think there, there are real kind of revenue challenges for smaller institutions at the, at, at the moment particularly for local authority museums particularly for independent uh, museums and ultimately our trustees have a statutory responsibility a legal responsibility to look after the collection uh, and so th that's, you know, that's the core point from which we, we then seek to, to help others. Great, thank you. Um, we've had um, several other questions that kind of focus on your um, activity online and whether um, having more content online and um, whether that's videos or behind the scenes content 
is that going to form um, is that going to be a bigger part of your strategy going forward kind of regardless of of how this pans out um, I, I, th I think we we need to fulfill our, our key obligation which is obviously to have the collections online so that you can access the collections um, as, as effectively as possible and there's always more work to do as all, all of you know digital can be uh, a very expensive business there's always more work to do with more images and better images um, and and ensuring uh, that that people can can see the work properly and there's more work to be done with engaging new audiences through social media and new platforms in different and exciting ways so i think i i, I think we were all thinking that the the digital presence of a uh, of an exhibition or the digital presence of research was going to be you know an increasingly important part of the museum's activities and what's happened over the last a few months has only accelerated that thinking so yes we, we, will, we will definitely uh, be, be thinking how we ensure our kind of digital footprint um, is, is, is handled more effectively but we also have to be realistic about our budgets um, you know we're not Netflix we're not the BBC we're not the Guardian um, we're, we, we are a, a museum uh, with limited public funds uh, and so we're never going to be able to achieve uh, I don't think what what other museums around the world also can achieve because you can enter the VNA for free uh, and you can't enter the Metropolitan Museum or the Rikers Museum for free you have to pay at the door uh, the VNA you come in free uh, and so whilst we look at some of the resource available to other uh, museums for digital with, with envy there also is a cost for that in terms of free access um, Gillian, I'm just going to enter in because I've seen one on the chat, which I think is quite interesting and, and runs on from a mention of the Rijksmuseum. It's from a Dutch dealer, antiques dealer, uh, who specialises in oriental works of art. And they've um, asked, how do you feel art and antique dealers can collaborate with museums to contribute to increasing enthusiasm? for the decorative arts amongst the younger generations. Because I suppose one of the key things at the moment is that we are, we've got the kind of um, ability to open on the 1st of June as the non-essential retail. So how can we help infuse the decorative arts? Um, yeah. You want to be careful about describing yourselves as non-essential retail. <laughs> it's I know, that's the, <laughs> hang on, that's the DCMS's definition. Leisure and non-essential. We haven't asked for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's enormous knowledge in the trade. Um, we've had many curators who've come from um, the trade, um, who've come from, you know, very prestigious um, houses and, 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 and sales houses. Uh, and, and so, you know, there, there, there should be knowledge sharing uh, between colleagues um, in that way. I also think many of uh, you and your members are, are, are brilliant communicators and, and broadcasters and we've seen the public appetite for that so encouraging excitement around um, uh, ceramics or you know, um, oriental decorative arts in European collections is, is you know because you are in the sales business a lot of the time uh, that that's part of what you do um, so successfully um, and I, I, I think ensuring in, in the long run, if I could say, that, that some of your clients are encouraged to support museums um, because there, there is a symbiosis, there's a cultural um, ecology, a successful museum sector connects often very readily with a successful antique sector and a successful decorative arts uh, uh, sector. Uh, and it's no surprise that you know, the boom in London in the museum is also connected to the boom in London in, in art shows, in fairs, in galleries. Um, and so, um, you know, encouraging high net worth individuals to think about their civic duty in, in supporting uh, publicly funded museums is, is a very important part of what you could do. Um, have you got another question, Gillian? I have. Um... Thanks. Are there are there some lessons that smaller museums and institutions um, can learn from the V&A um, in regards to uh, interacting with their audience um, while their doors are closed? Um, I think it's very very hard to 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 say to, to smaller museums who are incredibly constrained budgets, you know, do do X, Y, or Z. I think I think the most important thing to do 
is revenue protection and retention of supporters. So extensive communication to your support circles um, is, is very, very um, valuable. Uh, and then I think what, what not just we've discovered, but what the world has discovered is that, um, you know, those individuals who love their collections and work in the collections are, are often the best ambassadors for explaining and exploring them. Um, and we all look at that. Uh, I think it's the, it was the kind of cowboy museum in Utah or something who gave over their Twitter account to the security guard. And <laughs> the numbers went through the roof because he loved the place. He, he knew it and, uh, and wanted to talk about it. So I think, a, I think a, a, a quirky approach to celebrating the permanent collection alongside a regular engagement with supporters. Great, thank you. Um, just looking through them here. Um, one person had asked um, on um, d developing digital, um, what are your thoughts on um, all of the new technology with VR, AR, XR, um, and, and do you, have you been thinking about developing these for the V&A? Uh, I mean, yes. Um, so, so we're we're working with a number of companies, particularly around exhibitions. But again, this is going to take a real hit because um, you know we, we were amongst the first to have audio um, in you know our David Bowie exhibition. Um, but I think there's going to be a great deal of hesitation now around you know, the use of shared audio facilities, the, the use of tablets, um, all, all of that uh, material, the use of goggles, um, without you know strict. Um, and strict and almost obvious um, hygiene um, processes. Um, but at the same time, um, digitally and the ability to wander through, um, you know, the collections, to wander through an exhibition, the use of VR in that capacity will definitely, will definitely grow. Um, but there we, we will have to be in conjunction with private organisations and private businesses because we won't have the resource to do it at the level that people now expect these things to be done at um, and Google Google Arts and Culture are you know big and important leaders um, in this field so we're we are up for partnerships which allow that but um, our own capacity to deliver it ourselves will, will be limited and ultimately again you know what do we have we have the objects and we have the feel and we have the, the sensibility of the place so we can celebrate it and, 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 and work with technology, but we should never lose sight of um, the, the kind of civic feel of a museum. Thank you. Um, I think we've got time for just two more questions. So I think Gillian's going to find one more and then there's one I've seen that I'd quite like to ask. Um, great. So um, another person has asked, do you think the audience of VNA will change post lockdown? Um, I, I genuinely don't know the answer. Um, I, I, as I said, I, I, I think we will see um, some some nervousness around young young families tra traveling into central London. I think to begin with, more Londoners will come to their their local museums, um, and and we're see, we're seeing that certainly in Italy and uh, in Rome and in Florence, where the Romans and the Florentines are are, are heading back to the galleries and it's almost celebrated by by the owners of the, by the by the directors of those galleries saying you know come and visit it without the tourists um, uh, come and see your, your galleries uh, for yourselves but then you know we are a national collection so the taxpayers of Stoke-on-Trent pay for for example the V&A collection so we have a responsibility to ensure that they feel they can come and see it and we connect with them as I say digitally uh, as well. So we'll, we'll begin, I think, with quite a strong London focus, but then begin, hopefully, to, to broaden out again. Um, thank you. I've seen two more, actually, that I, I'd love to um, ask. So one is, um, in 2019, the Royal Collection celebrated Leonardo's 500th by sending groups of drawings to museums around the country before bringing them all together at the Queen's Galleries. This allowed people who could not travel to London or Edinburgh to see some of the real exhibits. Could you could this be a model, do you think, for museums generally to get a few small cherry pick, a few key items um, that could tour the country uh, for people who don't want to come to London and also to keep the pressure off public transport and things like that? Well, we had a really successful um, exhibition for the bicentenary 
uh, of Victoria and Albert um, uh, at Lincoln. Uh, so we, we did kind of treasures of the VNA um, at Lincoln, precisely um, on um, on that um, that that model. Um, I th I think you you you. It's difficult because on you you want to build up in a sense the the resilience and the creative strength of um, of our, our regional colleagues, and sometimes that can help with with loans. Other times it can be a, a broader and thicker relationship which supports research and curatorial capacity o over the longer term. So we are, you know, always happy um, to lend. But I think that I think the days when you had those kind of you know traveling collections of you know the VNA or the National Gallery around the country um, are are slightly over when when you see the degree of mobility but also you know the incredible collections whether in Birmingham or Manchester or or, or, or Edinburgh which are also um, available. Leonardo was special because Leonardo is Leonardo and it's also the Royal Collection and you don't get to see this stuff uh, very often so when it's a kind of big hitting name like that and you're absolutely right they were queuing around the block in Derby to <laughs> see them and, uh, and elsewhere and it was a huge um, huge success uh, but I think in I think it's a, it's a kind of longer term relationship which is ultimately makes the most difference. Um, and the last question, which is a sort of, uh, well, I suppose it's interesting, both as a director of a museum as also as a parent. Uh, do you think it's a good idea, given that academic visits won't be able to happen, that schools could authorise parents to take their children out of school and do day trips to museums? Well, the, the so that it takes the pressure off Saturdays and Sundays, particularly. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it's very interesting. The current regulation is that when, when schools go back, there is no obligation on parents to send their children back. Now, yeah. whether that will, whether, <laughs> so they can come and see all of your galleries from the 1st of June um, yeah. and, uh, and, and enjoy them. Um, whether that will be the case in, in September, I'm not sure. I'm probably, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned. I think if, if, if it's time for school, you've got to go to school. Uh, and as, as soon as you um, start allowing, uh, you know what it's like. Everyone's got an educational trip. Oh, it was an edu yeah. educational trip to, you know, go to the <laughs> to ACDC. Game. Exactly. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, but uh, I kind of, I know what you mean. But I think, I think poor old head teachers. If we, if 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 we kind of undermine them, it's it's trouble. Okay, well, um, it just it sort of leaves me to say thank you. I mean, a huge thank you from Lepada for kicking off our Lepada Leaders uh, series. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for sparing the time. Um, and I hope that it also means some people will kind of donate, maybe buy the catalogue. Become a and member. A become a member. And become a member. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Well, we can we can definitely put something out about that on our newsletter and everything as well. Um, right. But uh, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you.